Okay, so in this video, um, what I really want to do is I kind of want to deal with a, a very common, I would say, pretty widespread perspective, um, which is it's all about interpretations. You can see that from the title. Um, there's this idea like with Torah and Torah teachings that there's just kind of like there's a lot of different interpretations and they're all kind of good and they're all equal and, and um, there's just many different ways to kind of, you know, interpret things and they're all true. And it's interesting because for me, that was something which when I was growing up, I kind of just took that as a given because people really either said that uh, overtly or it was kind of just implied in different contexts and t classes and conversations. Um, but then as I got a little older, I started to really think about that carefully and it started to become very difficult for me to get how that would work because um, while I think that there's definitely, definitely different ways of looking at one issue, um, the idea that like there's just kind of multiple truths that could sometimes be mutually exclusive um, or contradictory in a very direct way was very difficult for me to figure out how to put that together and just sort of think about that in a normal way. Um, and so I want to sort of just illustrate uh, in what way that's not true and what way that, in what way that is true. And I'm going to do that with an example that uh, just sort of I was having a conversation tonight about this uh, exact uh, issue. For those of you who uh, watched the, check it out if you haven't watched it yet, the video that I put out about the neshama. And then neshama, um, the meaning of the word really refers to our consciousness. That when you look at another self, or when you you know you sort of you look at another person, look into their eyes, you see there's there's you're trying to see them, kind of like shining through the eyes, and and that self, that you know awareness, whatever word you want to use for that, that sort of like we are, we are the self, and we are just kind of coming through this this tool that we call the body and the personality, and and you know we use the, our thoughts and our personality to sort of manifest ourselves. So that's what the neshama really talks about. It's the self that's coming through. And then there's a word that I reference in that in that video about um, what the actual experience of seeing that self is. In other words, like it, the neshama refers to the actual self, but that's what the word refers to. But then there's also your experience of actually perceiving or being aware of that self as it is being manifest through the body into the world. So when you look into somebody else's eyes and you are experiencing the self, there's a word for that experience. And so the word for that experience is the word yira. And I referenced that in that video a little bit and I just want to sort of show that word yira is a great example of this phenomenon of there being multiple interpretations that are not all created equal. See, the word yira for the last, I don't know, few decades I would say, um, one of the popular translations of that word, um, I think in, definitely in the American culture, has been the word fear. And the word fear is, you know, a very specific word. It's actually another Hebrew word in, uh, for the word fear, which is the word pachad. Um, but the word fear was kind of just very commonly translating the word yira. For example, the phrase yiras shamayim, yirat shamayim. So that literally means fear of heaven. If you want to get really literal, you could translate it as fear of the sky. Uh, but, you know, usually translated to mean fear of heaven. And so if you want to work on your Yirat Shamaim, it means you're somehow supposed to be working on your fear of heaven. And then it got a little more advanced, and there were some people who didn't like that so much, and they felt like it wasn't nuanced enough and didn't really capture what the word Yira was about. And they sort of traded that in for the word awe. And there's really a few people that did that more recently. Someone brought to my attention, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Uh, he's one of the people who translates it that way. But I already saw it way before I ever heard of Rabbi Sachs um, in different, different books that I read when I was in high school. And it really, it, you know, that was like the next phase translation of the word Yira because it felt more like, you know, fear didn't really seem like it captured it. But so when I, you know, and then when I saw both of those translations, I was always kind of like, okay, these are like two different interpretations of the word. And it was a nice example of situations where there's just different interpretations. And I did a little bit more research, and I'm not going to go into the full depth of the analysis of the word now, in terms of yira, meaning awareness of the self. But the, the, if you go through that process, so I kind of, you know, where I really got with that is that the word yira actually describes the phenomenon, the experiential phenomenon, your experience of the awareness of another self. In other words, you have an awareness that there's someone else there. When someone else walks into the room, so then there's now someone else there. And we don't just mean that there's a body there. In other words, if there would be a body that was in the room and there was no one manifesting through that body, what we call a dead person. So that would be a little bit of a different experience than when there's actually someone there. Now, it could be creepy when you encounter a dead body since you're so used to there being someone shining through the body, so it's a weird experience. But it's not its not a year uh, awareness of the presence of another self in that situation, at least not in the classical sense. Although it's a bit of a longer discussion to explain what we experience when we see a dead uh, a body that is no longer animated by a person's neshama. But the point for right now is that the word Yura describes that awareness of there suddenly being someone else present. And so, 
the the thought process here that I, you know, someone just asked me this a little while ago, and they said, well, these are just different interpretations. The word yira could mean awareness of another self. It does mean that. It also could be interpreted as awe, and it also could be interpreted as fear, and these are all true interpretations. So I wanted to sort of show you for a moment how to really think about the idea that these are all true interpretations. Because while it is a true statement to say these are all true, the question is how much of the truth is each one really encompassing? Because you could have words that are true, and yet they don't tell you the whole story. So let's take an example as an analogy, and then I'll sort of walk you through the analysis in terms of the word yira. I, I work as a teacher in a school. So you could look at me and say, oh, this guy, Zev Bannett, is a teacher. And that's not false. That is a true description of my situation. If you told somebody that, you know, I'm a couch, that would be very different. It seems like it's a false statement. Saying that I'm a teacher is a true statement. But then you could also say other things. You could say that I am a father. You could say that I am a friend. You could say that I am, you know, a, a, a licensed driver. You could describe me in terms of various facets of my, of my manifestation, the way that I kind of come across in the world, how I play this character in the world, you could describe different facets and they are all true, but none of them comprise the totality of what those things actually represent. And also none of those terms show how they all interconnect. So that's essentially what we mean when we say there are different interpretations. Like you could look at something from multiple angles and see how, you could see it you know, in different ways, and they're all true, but none of them are really including the entirety of the situation or of the concept. So the same thing is true with all the Torah concepts. Let's take an example like, we use, we'll use Yira. And so when we talk about Yira meaning fear, or meaning awe, or meaning awareness of the presence of another self, so I would like to just illustrate the, the, the third meaning, the awareness of the presence of another self, is the ultimate meaning. In other words, it is the, it is the, it is the root. In the analogy of Zev Bannett being a teacher or being you know, a friend or a dad. So the, the, the analogy would be um, that I am Zev Bannett. In other words, the, the one thing which comprises all of that is the name Zev Bannett. That is like the totality. Zev Bannett means all of those things. And so if you want to talk about me, so you can be like, hey, look, there's that teacher, or hey, there's that dad, but that's only a fragment of the totality. If you want to talk about me in totality, you want to use a word that describes that, it's the word Zev Bannett. So here also with the word yira, the definition that is the totality of what this is, is the awareness of the presence of another self. At least in English, we're going to use those words. And then that relates to the other, you know, elements that are raised in terms of fear or awe in the following ways. See, when you're aware of the presence of another self, so that means that now there's someone else there who is in a certain profound kind of way, able to give you feedback on your own existence. So in other words, when you're, you're kind of doing your thing, you're, you're operating in this place that we call the world, and if there's no one else there, so then now you're kind of operating inside your own mind and your, in your own head, you have no reflective elements coming back at you to give you any kind of feedback about what, what the meaning or importance of what you're doing actually is, and so the significance of what you're doing is. So the, having the other self present is what now gives your, your you know, behavior or your, or your actions or your existence a certain kind of validity. In other words, if you don't have someone else there to sort of be a reflector for you, it's in a certain kind of way, like you don't really, you'll experience yourself as if you don't really exist fully. And so that's why being alone is something which if you do it constantly, it can be very difficult because there's just no, there's no validation of your being. There's no way to sort of sense, here's where I end off and someone else begins and now we have this kind of interface or interaction. That's also what the whole point of Rosh Hashanah is all about. It's about kind of experiencing there's someone else who's aware of what you're doing and that cares and that there's some kind of responsibility between you and them where you actually have this, this interface and dynamic between you. So when someone else is there, so now you kind of exist in a more full way because of the reflective elements. And that can be something which is very frightening. It can lead to fear. You can have an emotional response of fear in that type of situation because when there's someone else there, so if it's just you by yourself, so there's no one there to, for, you, to, for you to experience yourself in reflection from or towards, but when there's someone else there, sometimes you can actually be overwhelmed by their presence. In other words, it's like there, there's someone there who is other than you. They now see you, they know things about you, they encounter you, and that means they, you know, there's a certain vulnerability when there's someone else there that now they see things about you. And so that's, that can sometimes be very frightening because we, are, we can be frightened of the, of the potential to actually be almost like erased in the presence of the other person. Someone else being there means we can get caught, we can actually be, you know, we can be noticed or, or uh, in, in negative ways. And those types of experiences lead to an, exist an emotional response of fear. 
generally, we are afraid of being erased. All of our fears tend to, tend to emanate from one core issue, which is that we are afraid that something will happen to us, that we will actually be, you know, someone else will, will in some way remove us. We could actually, we, our bodies could die, or we could just suddenly become irrelevant. Socially, you could become irrelevant if you're in a situation and someone, you know, um, pushes you out, makes you feel like you're not part of a group, or, or doesn't let you speak and kind of continuously speaks over you. There's, that, that leads to a certain kind of, ex of fear also, the sense of like just being blocked out, being erased, and so if it, you can have that kind of situation when you're experiencing the presence of another self in a way that eliminates you, that annihilates you, that, that erases you, so then that triggers fear responses. If, you, if you're before somebody who's just much more overbearing and they're threatening to either, it could be anything, fire you, remove you, you know, re reject you, those are things that create a fear response as a direct result. So fear is a byproduct of, of Yira. Yira is that there's someone else there and now it's like that can be a very frightening result. But since fear is an emotion, so that emotion is a result, is a byproduct of the underlying perception that there's someone else here. So the fear can't be the actual definition of Yira, but it can be a facet or a manifestation of what Yira is. Similarly, you talk about awe. So when you look at the, into the eyes of another, of another body and you see the self shining through there and you discover something about that self that you didn't know before and you're constantly being exposed to that self, so that creates a situation of, of wow, like there's there's so much, like it's a profoundness, it's a profound awareness. It's like there's someone else here and you know, it just looks like there's a body, but the more you listen to them, the more you learn them, the more you're blown away by how much there is to discover, how much they have that is kind of like inside or hidden as part of the total self that they actually are, that now you're getting a little bit of a taste of that through the experience of their presence as it manifests through their body. That's awe. That's what's called yiras haromamus. It's like this sense of like, wow, there's an awareness of the presence of this other self, and it is so beyond anything that I'm used to like thinking about or imagining. They're just so incredible. And so that, that's a certain type. That, that's what awe refers to. But at the root, so yira just means awareness that there's someone else there, the presence of the other self. And that, and that you know, process of, of developing that awareness is something which is an ongoing process. Sometimes it leads to fear, emotional responses. Sometimes it, it leads to awe. It can lead to all kinds of results. But the point is that that's the definition of the word. And that definition plays out in every place that you read it. You will find that definition operating in a very significant way. If you read it in the Chumash, in the Gemara, it's extremely important to understand that definition because otherwise you just put, if you start plugging fear, or even awe into other places, into, into different places. So since that's only a nuance or a facet of the word, so then you're going to actually come, you know, fall short in understanding what the text that you're reading is actually saying. So this is a good example. Again, at, at the point I'm trying to make, really the meta point here, is that interpretations are are not all created equal. There are more central elements, there are ancillary elements, there are you know external elements like that, and they're facets of the larger picture. And so the idea that they're just kind of like this hodgepodge of just different interpretations. This person says this way, that person says that way, and these are just you know separate interpretations. That's not true. There's no such thing as that in the Torah. There are concepts that are clearly demarcated, that have specific meanings, and they are because they are very profound and deep, they have many nuances and facets in terms of how they actually manifest and express themselves, just like you yourself are also very, very deep. You are beyond this world, and you, have, you manifest in so many different ways. So there are different ways we can experience you, but you are still you, the one you that is behind all of that. And the same thing is true with the Torah. So it's, I'm really coming here to sort of debunk or, or remove this very uh, superficial idea that there's just kind of like many different interpretations. And I want to stress, this is even true with commentaries. If you're learning different commentaries on the Chumash or on the Gemara or any other Torah, Torah text, this is also still true. In other words, there are different interpretations that they'll have different reads on a text. Your job is to sort of pull back and look at the interpretations and figure out where they all connect. What is the underlying premise that everybody is working with? And then what different facets of the underlying premise are actually being focused on in each individual interpretation? but they're just part of a larger picture and it's and it's always like that it's like the, it's it, and, and, and the rare occasions where it isn't so you'll have situations where there's actually a, a wrong approach where someone says something and it's actually wrong so it's important to understand these distinctions because otherwise you start getting into this very vague lip it's like a certain type of liberalness where it's like well everything goes it's a pluralism in a sense of like well everything is just true and the thing is that in life not everything is true there are some ideas that are not true or they're not they're not you know totally true in the way that they're being expressed they're being taken beyond their bounds or they're actually just completely false and so 
to be able to start sifting through that, you have to have an anchor. You have to first of all have a belief and an awareness that there are actually ideas here that are true, that can be confirmed, verified, you know, textually, conceptually, and then there's facets to those ideas. But if you don't have that kind of conviction, so then it's very hard to learn anything because you're just kind of lost in an ocean of, oh, everything is true, so what difference does that make? So that I hope that example is relatively, relatively clear. Another great example, by the way, is the word Kedusha, and just throwing that in there as an ending, which we'll talk about in a different video, but usually translated as holy, which has, seems to have no meaning, or separate, which also is not what the word means. Clearly, it's against the Gemara, by the way, to say the word uh, Kadosh means separate, and the meaning of the word Kadosh is very specific, and then separateness is kind of part of it. It's a facet of or, or byproduct, but these are like real, there's a very, very real meaning of the word Kadosh, which we need to use and understand when we're reading texts exactly the same way. And there's many, many examples of this. So you can think about the Kadosh one, and when I put out a video about that, um, I'll, I'll eventually get to that, and then we will talk about it more at length. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, and looking forward to seeing you on the channel.